February is National Heart Month, a time to celebrate healthy hearts and take action to learn about and prevent heart disease. Today, we're gonna to take the first step to a healthy heart by talking with board certified cardiologist and electrophysiologist, Dr. Evan Gedramus with Baptist Healthcare and the Baptist Heart Rhythm Center. Thanks for being here. Certainly. Well, I know we're gonna get into some more specifics about heart rhythm disorder um, as we progress in our conversation, but let's just start off by like, what type of common um, heart problems or heart diseases do you see in older adults? Sure, sure. Thank you for having me again. Um, so cardiovascular disease, again, continues to be one of the most important um, illnesses that one is gonna be faced with. And if we look over age of 40, about half of men, about a third of women are gonna be faced with a cardiovascular disease at some point in their lifetime. What makes this so common? Um, again, I think a number of risk factors have been invoked, uh, including, you know, starting from genetics, but mm -hmm. change in our diet recently, anything from a salt intake, um, smoking was quite prevalent in the 60s and 70s, and we've certainly made some inroads as far as smoking sensation, lifestyle changes, uh, being aware of, you know, obesity epidemic, especially central obesity, those would be all the risk factors that Mm -hmm. perhaps have slowly increased. And it really is a disease of more of a developed countries rather than emerging countries mm -hmm. where uh, infectious disease usually used to predominate, but now cardiovascular disease has taken over and it's kind of become a number one killer mm -hmm. across the world, not just the United States. Well, I know there's, you know, like the risk factors and people tend to know some of those, but what about the symptoms? How would someone know if they might have this and should, you know, consult someone like yourself? Certainly, certainly. Uh, before we even talk about the symptoms, so let me kind of break down the cardiovascular okay. disease just a little Great. bit further. Please do. Um, I think you know it's important to keep it in mind that majority of them happen are directly related to heart disease, and that can be related due to the plumbing or coronary artery disease. There's also a muscle problem, a heart failure. There's also an electrical problem, such as sudden cardiac death, and then there's also uh, per what we call a peripheral vascular disease or blood vessel disease, and that involves strokes and abdominal aortic aneurysms as well as um, leg blood vasculature disease that can also have different presentations. So that's why I wanted to make that distinction because sure. you, you know anything that's sort of central from the heart is going to often most commonly present with chest pain being the most common. However, it really varies based on a patient because many patients will insist that they're not having pain, they're having pressure or they're having chest okay. discomfort or tightness. So it's really a constellation of symptoms, how they describe the pain, you know, sort of more of a gradual onset and it tends to occur with exertion. Those would be more, more common symptoms. But about 10% of, you know, heart attacks don't even present with pain. People, again, have neck discomfort or radiating discomfort to the neck, radiating discomfort to the shoulder or the back. So there's a considerable variation and that's where I think, you know, having a doctor's input and just mm -hmm. having a suspicion of some, oh, I do not feel well a lot of times warrants seeing a physician. Well, what kind later. of test um, do people typically run? Is there a blood test, stress test? I know there's several, I'm sure. Correct. So, you know, the tests are, are can also kind of be broken down to preventative uh, tests that okay. one would get. You know, mm -hmm. if you were to see your primary care physician, the first things that we always look at is obviously measure your blood pressure and then cholesterol tests, and those are the first sort of risk factors we would try to address. If you were to be seen in the emergency room for an episode of chest pain, then EKG has a strong role as well as uh, blood work that can, you know, pick up an old heart attack or an imminent heart attack. Those are also become important. Uh, going further, your physician will probably risk stratify you based what further imaging you're going to be needed. Um, is there anything, let's say someone has uh, a history of some of the risk factors, uh, is there anything that can be implemented as far as behavioral changes that would prevent it getting worse or even maybe undo some of it? Absolutely, and I think that's um, where a lot of the emphasis is being placed now is preventative medicine, you know, from um, people seeing their primary care uh, more regularly from, you know, Obamacare, putting a focus on preventative medicine being cheaper um, and more accessible as opposed to waiting for an event to happen. So, again, p education about weight loss, central obesity, increasing your exercise about three times a week, you know, 30 minutes. Um, um, actually, alcohol intake is beneficial for heart disease. Uh, you know, quitting smoking is very important. Some people almost even propose that we should cut out all the salt of our diet. We would actually save more lives than if the cigarettes never hit the market. So there's, you know, being aware of those things is important. Okay, well, um, as an electrophysiologist, I know you work hand in hand with a lot of cardiologists, uh, specifically in the area of heart rhythm disorder. Talk a little bit about, about that, so we, we would get to that. Certainly. Um, 
our, you know, presentation for an electrophysiology, again, that's an electrical um, problem of the heart, usually can be somewhat different. And actually, our own society, Heart Rhythm Society, tries to make a distinction that the electrical problems are quite different from a heart attack problems. Both of them can actually uh, present with a, an aborted death or sudden cardiac arrest, as we would describe it. But in a way, it's they have this campaign where it's called uh, comparing apples to oranges. Um, we, things we would be looking for would be if somebody suddenly passed out for unexplained reasons or somebody experiences rapid racing heart that are associated with nausea and, or overall feeling unwell and lightheaded and coming close to passing out. That's where we're really important. Um, the other common thing is uh, atrial fibrillation. That is extremely uh, common in an elder population. 10% over the age of 70 is going to have this condition and that um, frequency or that incidence is going to increase as uh, one is going to get older. And the biggest concern there is a stroke prevention. The presentation there often is a, it's a sensation of a fish flopping in your, ch in your chest. That's probably the best explanation for it. An irregular rhythm or a weak, faint pulse mm -hmm. uh, that one would. Is the treatment for the rhythm disorder different than someone who just has a high risk for maybe a heart attack or stroke? Correct. There's a whole um, set of medications that are completely different from, you know, somebody had a heart attack again. So there's a a bunch of new blood thinners that have been introduced to the market lately that are going to minimize your risk of stroke. There's medications that are going to prevent these electrical problems from potentially getting worse, but there's a, a very wide array of, uh, of procedures that are called, some of which are called ablation procedures, some of which eliminate some of these uh, rhythm problems, in other words, are curative, some of which can help you manage them. Mm -hmm. And that's where the conversation starts. Uh, that's part of the relationship with the physician as well. And a lot of times we try medicines first to see if something works and then go on, proceed to the procedure. Do some of the rhythm problems, um, are they evidenced in the, the other tests that you do just for, for heart disease? We certainly pick general? them up. We pick them up a lot of times on the EKG. A lot of it is also dependent on the um, patient's symptoms. Many of the rhythm problems we actually are able to foresee before they actually happen. And that's where the relationship with the cardiologist is very important because we can tell patients that are at risk based on an uh, EKG or an echocardiogram that was done by a cardiologist and then ultimately we would get the referral. So we don't have to wait for somebody being at home and suddenly passing out mm -hmm. for what could be a dangerous rhythm and we can you know, act preemptively. Okay. Well, before we wrap up, um, if someone's at, uh, at home watching and they want to find out more or maybe try to find a cardiologist, what should they do? Certainly. Quick. Um, you know, for our group alone, we have a great website where a lot of our information is available. You know, building a, a trust and a rapport with the patient is very important, and I think personality of the physician and the patient is important. You can glean some of that from our profiles available online. Our Heart Rhythm Society has some great resources about the conditions that we have, um, you know, and that's a lot of times is a starting point. But again, that trust and relationship is going to be important. There's so much information out there, and you're going to need somebody you can trust to help you interpret that. Great advice, and thank you for being right. here.